Well, good morning, friends. Thanks for braving the slushy snow. And those at home, thanks for staying in your jammies. Well done there. So we just settle into this space now. I invite you to roll those shoulders back and be in this body. Feel that breath as we start this time together. So I took some much-needed time off a few weeks ago, and part of that time I ventured to Holden Village for a women's retreat weekend. And uh, so Holden, I've talked about it a lot. Holden Village is in the, it's an isolated retreat center in the um, Cascade Mountains. It's 3,000 feet up above the north end of Lake Chelan. And it's just gorgeously wrapped in snow this time of year, right? So it's just lovely. And I was lovingly welcomed into a group of eight women who were headed up to the retreat together. It included my sister-in-law, Jennifer. It included Erica Sohm, who's a part of the community here at Salt House. And the eight of us, like we went, we did it. We went a day early and did a wine tasting in Chelan on Thursday. We headed up to the village on Friday for the retreat. And I had just had such, I said such good girl time and like alone time and rest time and play time. And then while I was there, I tested positive for COVID on Sunday afternoon. I know, right? And I'd gotten it before I got there. Um, and I tested before I went and all the things. But, and I'm still, I'm still pretty exhausted from COVID and I'm coming out of it. And I woke up this morning with like, I could hardly talk. So stay with me for however it goes with the voice this morning, okay? But so I was there. I was in this isolated village in the Cascade Mountains where everyone lives in close community. And I just tested positive for COVID, right? So I'm standing there, and earlier in that same week, I'd managed to bang my head with a car door, which triggered, for me, concussion symptoms in my body, this response that happens for me, because I'm four and a half years out from having had a concussion that became, a post, it became post-concussion syndrome. And if you've been around, you know I've been on this journey of healing and transformation with my body and my spirit since then, and certain things trigger those concussion symptoms again, like bonking my head, which was a super huge bummer as I'd been looking forward to this time of rest and play and being out of town, and so I was like, man. So that had already been happening that week. So as I stood there in my little room in Chalet 2 at Holden Village on Sunday afternoon of the women's retreat, I'm staring at those two lines on my COVID test, and I was mindful of the work that I'd already been doing that week since balking my head. You see, not only were the concussion symptoms happening for me that week, but also like this full body terror, this panic would course through my body. And I've, I've grown familiar with this terror feeling. It often creeps in after I bonk my head. And it often shows up in the middle of the night, and that terror that rolls through me is the terror of what if right? All the what ifs about how bad this could be. Like in this case, you know, I was doing like, man, what if, what if I can't go on the retreat? What if this is so bad? I have to like take a break from work again. And so I'm standing there, COVID positive at Holden with the sounds of like other women laughing in the other room. And I was aware of how I could easily start catastrophizing over this too, right? Oh, how that terror could start rolling through me about how bad this could be for me, for my brain, for my family, for Salt House. Like, what about long COVID? Like, not to mention if there was, like, a COVID outbreak, like, at Holden, and I'm like, it was all my fault, you know? So in that moment, I decided that I wasn't going to do that. Like, honestly, I think I was too weary to even try to overthink it. Like, I'd been so in need of rest and renewal and retreat, I was already starting to feel pretty COVID awful, and I'd been doing too much worry and terror and overthinking that week already. Like, I was done. Like, I I just couldn't, I just couldn't anymore. So after putting on my mask and walking out to tell the other ladies in my group that I was COVID positive and notifying the village leadership and determining, like, how, like, the logistics of how I would isolate and, like, head down the mountain the next day, I then like sorted that and I closed the door to my room. I climbed into bed and I surrendered to what was true in that moment. Like, I can't change this. Uh, God can can do more here than I can. And I'm gonna try to let God do that. And I just like burrowed down into my bed. (laughs) Friends, would you please uh, open your hands in front of you on your lap? Just like relaxed, palms up. This is something that we come back to often here at Salt House, how the life 
and the way of Jesus is described, embodied, put into practice like open hands, which is tough. It's tough to stay open like this, to live like this. Our nature is to close up our fists, to grab hold of what's ours, to overthink and overdo and over everything by holding tight, when in fact the story of God is one of release, of holding lightly, of giving away, letting go, forgiveness, grace, peace, hope, wonder, of opening up and staying open. But to live like this, to live the life of, and the way of Jesus, again, it's hard because Jesus doesn't just ask us to stay open and, and change on the surface, to change a few behaviors or just believe the right things or even just to focus on serving and loving others. This kind of open-handed, Jesus-shaped life asks of us everything, all of who we are, including the transformation of our opinions, our calendars, our wallets, our judgments, our will, our everything. And to be brutally honest, the church has historically and epically failed at forming this kind of open-hearted, Jesus-shaped people. Once Christianity became the official church of the Roman Empire in the fourth century, the focus became 100% on like changing a few behaviors and believing the right things, and sometimes focused on serving and loving others, instead of actually becoming, at our core, this kind of resurrection people that Jesus had called. And Salt House, y'all, there is a lot of beautiful work that God is doing in us here. But we too, me too, I'll own it for myself, like I have a lot to learn about how we actually are changed and healed and live this kind of Jesus-shaped life. And I say that like not to like finger wag and like shame and guilt, but to like point towards this beautiful life that remains available to us, which is absolutely what the season of Lent is about. Lent, these 40 days leading us up to Easter here at Salt House for Lent, we want to put into practice this open-handed way of being of Jesus. We want to be changed. And we're going to do that by exploring and practicing a way of living that has led to remarkable healing and transformation, the kind that Jesus taught us. It's a global movement, movement that has fueled, uh, it's fueled by humility and by grace. It's lived in beloved community, and it began in 1936, a grace that most of the time it gathers in church basements instead of the church sanctuary. Even with like worship happening upstairs each Sunday, the real transformations have continued in those church fellowship halls, in the conference rooms, and in those meetings downstairs. I'm talking, of course, about the 12-step program that is articulated in the so-called Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. The 12 steps are used as a practical way for individuals with the support of a sponsor to live and work through addiction. And it began with alcohol, but today these same 12 steps, the same program is used for healing addictions with drugs, with sex, with porn, overeating, like so many different things, because these are steps that work. And I will admit up front that I'm new to studying and practicing the, the 12 steps. It hasn't been a part of my life. And honestly, I'm realizing that even as I knew a little bit about the steps, I just had assumed that whatever was happening, like in AA meetings, it just wasn't for me. But man, I was uninformed and really oblivious. So as we're going to start this journey, I just want to own that I'm no expert. I'm open to feedback. And Pastor Ryan and Pastor Zach and I, like we are learning this as we go along with you and as we're in it together. Also, if you're new or newer to the 12 steps as I am, um, I want to name two assumptions um, that we are going to carry with us into this conversation for Lent, especially if you're sitting there going, wait, what? Like, why would we talk about the 12 steps like in sermons on a Sunday? Well, my friends, you will see. That's why we're doing it. It's going to be awesome. But also, here are two reasons for it, which I kind of I draw from um, Father Richard Rohr. So two assumptions for us to pay attention to. First, that the message of Jesus and the 12-step message are largely the same message. 
the wisdom of the 12-step program and the very marrow of the gospel of Jesus are so linked. What Jesus said in the 12-step message of Bill Wilson, a.k.a. Bill W., he's the one who's credited as, like, the assigned author of the 12 steps of the big book. There's some, like, kind of uncertainty about that for certain, but, you know, that, that's who's credited with it. But these messages are so similar, even down to some important details, which is why we also assume, number two, the 12 steps are for all of us. Father Richard Rohr says it this way, we are all spiritually powerless, not just those who are physically addicted to a substance, which is why the 12 steps are for everyone. Alcoholics just have their powerlessness visible for all to see. The rest of us, we disguise it, right, in different ways and overcompensate for our more hidden and subtle addictions and attachments. Just to say a little bit more about this, about number two, how it's for all of us. I had some conversation this week with um, Dean, who's a part of our Salt House community. He's very familiar with the 12 steps, and he will actually get to hear his Salt House story about his journey with the 12 steps in a few weeks. But as I spoke with him this week, I was, I was just like trying to land, okay, like what exactly is addiction, and what are the steps, and why is it that's for all of us? And this is where I kind of landed after talking with Dean. We all have our own substances and behaviors that we seek out to cope, right? We reach for food, we reach for control, for worry, we overwork, we overplan, we over everything. There's alcohol, pot, scrolling on our phones, there's shopping, sex, exercise, like so many things. So these are good things. And these good things that comfort and soothe and help us can cross a line when they become unhealthy for us. So the 12 steps can be used for any unhealthy coping tool or a tool that has become unhealthy in our use of it. Anything that we use to avoid trauma or our uncomfortable feelings. So let that kind of land for you. Is that, is that landing? You getting that? Yeah. See, this is like, it's for everyone. Like, this is for me. This is for you. It's for all of us. So for our purposes this Lent, we'll use language that refers to our addictions, assuming that we all have them in varying degrees, okay? The good things that are no longer good for us then, that we use to avoid our feelings, that we use even when, we, when they cause chaos in our lives, that's what we're talking about. These things wrap around us and bind us, which is actually one of the root definitions of the word addiction. Think, just get that image. It's something that binds us. In the New Testament, these things are often called demons, what Jesus faced in his wilderness, yes? So together, we can name those things that bind us, our demons. We can turn them over to God and maybe just, maybe loosen these ties that bind us as we live through this Lent together. Yeah, you with me? Because that's our journey this Lent, and I know it's really easy stuff. So, yeah, yeah. But today, we begin, and we're going to move through steps one, two, and three of the 12 steps. These three steps really establish this posture of open hands. And then the rest of the steps help us kind of walk that all out and keep that posture. So steps four through seven, they outline a, they outline a plan of self-assessment so we can recognize and own our character defects and with the help of God correct them. So that's four through seven. Steps eight and nine help us acknowledge that we, um, those that we've hurt because of our behavior, including ourselves, and then we make amends when possible so we can learn to live in the present as healthy humans. Then steps 10 through 12 keep us rigorously honest in our daily lives so we can continue to build a spiritual foundation for ongoing health and carry that message to others. I know, right? It doesn't sound like anything Jesus would be interested in, right? So, yeah. So you ready? Woo! Okay. Well, let's begin then with the first step. Will you please read it with me? Step one. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Uh, so I put alcohol in parentheses. That's what it says in the statement is alcohol, but I put in parentheses because we know that that's going to be a little bit different kind of thing for us each, depending on who we are. Um, but, but this is it. Read it again with me just as is with alcohol there. So let's say it again. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. <sighs> Step one. Step one names our condition. This is our condition, admitting our powerlessness and unmanageable lives. 
notice. The 12 steps don't begin, and neither do we, with a mission statement about how awesome we are and how hard we are going to work at this, right? And that is intentional. Here's what's shocking to our self-help culture. We can in no way engineer or steer our own conversion. The steps can only be worked through the ongoing death of the ego. Bill W., he recognized that very early in his 12-step program. The ego has to go. Otherwise, we try to, like in our ego awesomeness, engineer our own transformation by our own rules and with our own power, which is therefore, by definition, not transformation. If we try to change our ego with the help of our ego, we only have a better disguised ego. Oh, and I hate that because I want to design like a really comfortable plan for my own transformation, right? So for me, with this, just to get really honest and vulnerable with y'all about it. So at Holden, I'm standing there over my, cause, my COVID positive test. And my terror is there of all the what ifs for me. So what's actually underneath my terror that, I, that terror that's there is my terror of being bad. Like my addiction to being good enough. Like that's my jam, that's my thing. The demon of perfectionism is my demon. So my particular flavor at the core of me is that fear of what if, like what if I'm bad? Like that's the core fear, like what if I'm the bad thing? What if I don't do a good job or I fail or I disappoint or even harm another person. So like, what if I become the bad thing? So step one, how I would say it for myself is like, I've admitted that I am powerless over being good enough and that my life has become unmanageable. And what's, what's ridiculous about this is that I get a whole lot of positive feedback about my addiction to perfectionism, right? about being good and doing good. I get a lot of thumbs up, a lot of praise. And that started in childhood, right? Like with all the affirmation for like good grades, being good at sports, good at music, like being a nice person. And y'all, I became a pastor. Like talk about having a like good enough complex, right? <laughs> oh, oh, I am powerless. I am powerless. So and what is like good enough by my standards and definitions that continues to shift and evolve as I've become an adult, yet my whole life, all the ways I overplan, overthink, overwork myself to be good enough, it is 99% of the time seen as socially awesome, right? And yet the addiction to being good enough is destroying my health and causing more days than I would like to admit to be days that I suffer through. Because there is no point at which I can manage, like, there's no point at which what I can manage will ever be good enough, right? This, this good thing of hard work, like, to try to, like, have some control of things, like, that's not bad. Like, doing a, jo a good job is not bad. But that has become unhealthy for me. So step one is admitting that we have very little we can do to stay separate from that, sep that substance or behavior. We can't stay away from it. Like, I can't stay away from my compulsion to do all I can do to be good enough. And what I want, and what I want to do about it Man, I just want to fix it, right? Like, my ego is ready to go at being changed. And again, I, want, I just want to design my own comfortable plan for my own conversion. Like, but again, it doesn't work that way. So how does it work, right? So as Jesus said, unless the grain of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it remains only a single grain. But if it dies, it will yield a rich harvest. The 12 steps begin by admitting that we are powerless. We got nothing, and this is so potently present in the story of God. The way up is down. Jesus uses this metaphor of the grain of wheat in John chapter 12 and a branch cut off from the vine in John 15 for this arrogant ego. The ego cannot get us where we want to go. Its concerns are too small and too selfish. 
And it's that ego, that desire to go up before we go down, that ego is what drives us to keep our hands clenched into fists. And it's so hard to open because the ego hates more than anything else to, in the world to be, than being changed. It hates everything else. Even when the present situation is not working or is horrible, still doesn't want to change. Instead, we do more and more of what does not work, which is what many others have rightly said about addicts, but it's also true about all of us. So this is why the first step is probably the hardest, the most denied, and the most avoided. So the whole process never takes off because no one likes to die to who they think they are. Letting go is not in anybody's program for happiness, and yet all mature spirituality in one sense or another is about letting go and unlearning, period. Hence, open hands. So the first step in shorthand is simply, I can't. I can't. Friends, I can't free myself from this dependency on like trying to be good enough. I can't. I am powerless to it, and my life has become unmanageable. I can't. I invite you to try, just tr with those hands open, I invite you just to close your eyes and simply try saying these words loudly, boldly, I can't. I can't. Yes, we can't. That's the first step. And it's something that takes work as the, as the ego is released. So on the heels of that first step, this terrifying admission that our lives are unmanageable and we are powerless, that we can't, I invite you to read with me step two from the big book. Step two says, slide. <laughs> we lost it? I release control. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you for that reminder. Okay. So step two, I will say it to you twice. So we came to believe that a power, capital P, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. So again, it starts with I can't, I can't, I can't. But then step two, God can, right? That's step two. Having opened our hands is a sign that we are powerless. They are now open to receive from the power that is greater than ourselves, that longs to love and restore us to sanity. Uh -huh. I can't. God can. So for me, I see this as the recognition that the only real way forward for me is not the path that I'm making for myself. I can't do this on my own. I can't restore my sanity. I can't do enough good to give myself peace that I am good enough. It's never going to happen. I will never be good enough by my own efforts or control. And it's insane, insane to think that I could be. But God is the power that can restore my sanity. The real beautiful thing about um, these steps is that... Uh, We'll see it in the, in the third step as well. There's a real freedom about who we, who we say this power is. Um, but then as we look at this, okay, so how, how, how does this happen? How is my sanity restored? Well, I love Father Richard Rohr's work on this second step, that our work is to open and remain open. Like, that's what it's about. To have three spaces that we can actually talk about that are opened in us. They are our opinionated head, our closed-down heart, and our defensive and defended body. So head, heart, and body opened, like that open hands, right? That is the work of spirituality, and it truly is work, and it is the work of the second step, to believe that a greater power can restore. We can't, so we stay open to how God can. So putting God can, that second step, into practice, open head, open heart, and body. So each of those three areas, I mean, each of those are worth like an entire sermon series on their own, like how we talk about how we stay open, right? We're going to give each of them a paragraph, okay? Um, just letting the Spirit do some good work, even in our brevity, knowing that what we're talking about is the work of our lifetime, right? So we're going to touch on it. This is stuff we talk about and we'll continue to talk about. But I do want to share some of it. So how can we work step two? So I'm going to walk through a few ideas and 
Um, know that much of this we're actually putting in your hands today, which I'll point you towards in a few minutes, okay? But first, in regards to our heads, our minds are wired to sort, judge, and hold opinions. It's what's called the dualistic mind, right? We are so identified with our thinking and our capacity to see things and sort things. And the only thing that rewires our dualistic wiring is some form of contemplative or meditation practice. That's it. That's the only thing that can rewire us, a contemplative mind. So if you're someone who goes, uh, like if you're someone who shakes your head at meditation, whether you've tried and feel like you can't do it or you've never tried it, this is especially for you. Meditation and, con and, and contemplative prayer, it isn't about making your mind quiet or like stopping your thoughts, but learning how to see your thoughts and to hold them non-judgmentally. Like it's really a practice of seeing with compassion. So Bill W. was wise enough to name prayer and meditation like in step 11. So it's actually, it's just so necessary to, to the process that it'll be back later. So we'll say so much more about that later. But prayer and meditation, that's, that's what we need for our, our keeping our headspace open. For that heart space open, there, there are several things that we need. I'm going to breeze through a few of them. First, we almost all need some healing regarding the hurts we have carried from the past. Like full stop, right? Again, a whole sermon series could take up a conversation on how we heal our hurts from the past. This is therapy. This is tools like the Enneagram. So that, that is a piece of keeping our heart open. Also for the heart, we need to be in right relationship with people so that others can love us and touch us at deeper levels. And so we can love and touch them too. And nothing else opens the heart space in such a positive and ongoing way than right relationship. Fortunately, the other steps are all about working that right relationship with others. So there's so much more to come on that as well. But you can start even considering that and what that looks like even this week. Also for that heart space to be open, it's open by right brain activities, right? We know this. Our heart opens through music, art, dance, theater, nature, fasting, poetry, games, life-affirming sexuality, and of course, the art of relationship itself. And also, just to be fully honest, I think every heart needs to be broken, and, and broken open at least once in order to have a heart <laughs> at all, or at least a heart for others. All right, so that's heart space. Finally, our, to keep our bodies less defended is also the work of healing past hurts and the many memories that are stored in our bodies. There's vast emerging science and books and articles about how we hold memory in our bodies, yes? And because of that, it is necessary for our bodies to physically metabolize and release its traumas and the ongoing input of stress. Through body work, so we need this kind of stuff like exercise and stretching and snuggling. We need to move our bodies to move through what is in our bodies. Jesus usually physically touches people when he heals them. He knew that the memory of the hurts were lodged there in the body itself. So, step two, God can. And as you hear that, okay, yes, that's about releasing our defenses and keeping our various centers from closing down, living present to the moment, and becoming a marvelous receiving station where the power to restore our unmanageable lives to sanity, it meets us. Okay? So I want you to open those hands again. And uh, we have, now we have I can't and God can. So try both of those. I can't. God can, yes, yeah. And then step three, read it with me. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood God. Again, say it with me one more time. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood God. Again, the AA movement didn't mess around with like, let's figure out exactly who you think God is. Or you can, often you hear the phrase a higher power or the universe. Like it's really accessible for people from, from all traditions, which is really incredible. 
So step three, our hands are open, and this is the actual movement of surrender, like the decision moment. Having admitted our condition, I can't, and that the only restoration that comes will be outside of us, God can. We make a decision to do what is necessary to recover, admitting that we're willing to have everything change in order to be free. So for me, at Holden, holding my COVID positive test, and mostly out of exhaustion, deciding, man, I can't change anything. God can, God could do more here than I could. And I then intentionally, I chose to rest and not work out how I was gonna make this all be okay, how to make me okay and be good enough. And instead, I turned my will and my life over to the care of God as I climbed into bed in that moment. And then almost immediately, I started singing on repeat in my head a song that we had sung there at Holden on Friday night. We'd had a prayer around the cross service. So it's a song that was really simple and repetitive. And it was a song that was new to me, but its first words, I release control, grabbed my attention because release is my like guiding word that I'd chosen for 2023. So it's like my year for the, my word for the year. I was like, oh my gosh, this is for me. Um, so I was loving it when we sang it and then it was in my head, but little did I know how much I needed that song come Sunday, right? And it's that song that we were singing earlier in worship today, that I release control and surrender to the flow of God's love that will heal me. So I just was in bed and I just cycled on this prayer for a few hours. And it was a little bit later then and I, like, I was like, oh, you know, I'd really like to listen to some other music. So I looked on my phone to see what few songs I had downloaded from Spotify. Um, There's no Wi-Fi there. So among the few songs I had, I discovered this old playlist that I had saved two years ago from a friend who listened to this playlist when she paints. And I was scrolling through the songs and guess what song I found? I Release Control was on my phone, like on this playlist, and I'd never even heard it before. And so that sucker went on repeat for like 24 hours, which was just like amazing, but it also felt like this wink from God and I felt seen in my little snowed in corner of COVID isolation to have access to this song as my prayer. And I'm not great at contemplative prayer, but this song absolutely worked for me as I just rested into God with this prayer. And the lyrics, y'all, this song like is the first three steps, right? It is. So this third step truly is the moment of decision and it is hard. So Richard Rohr says how it is our will itself. You know, it is so stubborn. Like the ego's in there controlling some things like actually changing our will. Man, that does not want to surrender easily either. And usually only when it's the last resort or it's demanded of us by our partners, our parents, our children, our health or our circumstances. And that's how it felt for me that day. My exhausted, sick, and desperate circumstances at Holden, man, like, I, I didn't know at the time, but as, as I did this, oh, I can't do this, like, do this, God, you take it. I didn't know this because I hadn't, like, learned the steps yet, but this was this little micro experience of the first three steps that day. And again, out of my desperation, my life had become unmanageable. And man, I was handing that sucker over. And in making the decision to not overfunction and fix myself for what was happening, that song and that space that was created helped me root out those, those binding, those things that were binding around me and my thinking. I realized how, um, man, I felt like I was bad because I had COVID. And dear God, again, like, was, I, was the whole village going to get COVID because of me? And God loosened those binds then. And I could see, like, what's actually true, that, man, I was sick. And, like, being sick is not bad. It just is what it is. And actually, COVID, like, COVID is the bad thing. Like, I'm not the bad thing. But it took some work for God to rewire that thinking of how I saw myself in that experience. And I, did, I just didn't get there on my own. So, friends... This is the work of the 12 steps in the road following Jesus of turning our will and our lives over to the care of God. Jesus doesn't just ask us to change on the surface. Jesus asks of us everything, our whole lives, including our will, that our will would be God's will. Yes? It is the, it is the very way that Jesus lived himself. His whole life and ministry was one lived in surrender to God's will and care. And he even put it into words 
in the gardens of, of Gethsemane, yes? Just before his arrest and trial and execution, Jesus surrenders his will again. It's the honest prayer of decision where he says, God, if possible, can you take this cup from me? But he says, but he also says, I think it snuck up there. Is it there? He says, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. Can you imagine what the world would be like if all the Jesus followers around the globe actually lived steps one, two, and three, and all the rest of them too, but that were actually working through and lived with this practice of I can't, God can, and then finally, the surrender of our will in step two, uh, in step three, which is, I think, yep, I can't, so it's I can't, God can, and then I think I'll let God. I think I'll let God. Uh, can you imagine our world if we were actually living with these three practices? And the Met calls it the three-step waltz of AA, the three-step waltz of I can't, God can, I think I'll let God. I can't, God can, I think I'll let God. We just keep dancing it. Like what if we lived with a will that was surrendered not just to any ideology, theology, church, or denomination, but actually surrendered our lives and will to the care of God? And again, like Christianity historically became theory over practice. We concentrate on how to worship Jesus as one united empire instead of following Jesus in practical ways, even though he never once said, worship me, but often said, follow me. The 12 steps are actual things that we do to follow as it parallels and mirrors and makes practical the same message that Jesus gave us. But without over-spiritualizing the message and pushing its effect like out into the future or into a metaphysical world, it moves us into the action Jesus asks of us, experiencing the very practical steps of human enlightenment and the central message of our own transformation into the image of God and bringing about a new creation on this earth. I mean, come on. <laughs> So, now with all these words from the sermon, let's talk, about, let's talk about how this becomes action, okay? So I commend to you, please take with you today that little half sheet of paper that is in your bulletin. Uh, we have all the content um, linked. I think we'll have those also linked online for folks to access, yep, as well. So on this little half sheet, find some suggestions on how to explore and work these first three steps of the recovery movement this week. This is not the same as being in the recovery program at all. That's, that's not this, but these are ways to explore and practice in parallel the way of Jesus. There's so much more I could say about all of this, but I've already spoken for too long. Thank you for hanging in there with me. <laughs> but I hope you hear, one of the things that I was trying to do so I tried to lay out one of my own just like singular experiences of dancing this three-step waltz when I tested COVID positive at Holden. At Holden. Yet there are so many other stories I could tell you that reveal my demon of perfectionism, as well as the various substances and behaviors that I reach for when I am obsessed with control and needing to soothe and escape and not feel what I'm feeling. And I tried to share my own story in a way that it might open you up to seeing your own everyday behaviors that may be masking your own unhealthy coping tool or a tool that has become unhealthy in your use of it. Anything that you might use to avoid trauma or your own uncomfortable feelings. So my friends, as our three guitar players come back up today, it's really fun. It's a fun band today, thank you. Um, as they come back up, I just invite you back into that posture of open hands once more. As a sign of keeping your centers open, right? And I invite you to try just saying this three-step waltz of I can't, God can, I think I'll let God. I can't, God can, I think I'll let God. And try, friends, to ask God, what is it for you? As we take some, now, some time now, we'll sing again, I release control. And again, it speaks to this journey of the first three steps. I can't, God can, I think I'll let God. So friends, what do you need to release to our God who cares? 
We're going to keep asking this question as well in the weeks to come, but see what comes up today. But I encourage you to name it, your demon, what binds you, and frame it in the context of that first step. We did give you some post-its. There were two of them on the front of those bulletins. Um, there's more up here at the table as well. And I'm going to place the first step up here. As it'll be up there in a way that we can kind of fill in the blank together. So we're going to fill in the blank to, we admitted we were powerless over what is it for you? and that our lives have become unmanageable. So friends, what is binding you today? Try naming it, and then you can bring it up front during the song or later in the service, like during communion, and just name it before God. For folks worshiping at home, we also have a link you can go to where you can share anonymously if you'd like to, and we'll get those up there later as well. And so friends, we begin to work the steps towards a more honest spirituality this Lent, our journey to the cross and to resurrection on the other side begins with, I can't, God can. I think I'll let God. So God, we, so friends, we sing to God with our open hands as our prayer. surrender 